This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here. Go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today we have brought to you a guest, another guest. We've had David Watson. We've had Adam Bow from Cake, David Watson from Risk Advisor. Now we have Bill Haber from Tech Risk, all part of of Aubby Knight's Master Plan 101 Weston Labs, part of the Independent Insurance Agents and Brokers of North Carolina, and a bunch of my good friends are part of that project. So happy to have you on and talk about the stuff that you guys have going on um, yeah. up there. But more specifically, what you're doing to help you know the guys and ladies like me that are out there on the streets just trying to trying to turn a dollar every day and keep the dollars we have. You bet. Hey, let me start with, um, and I hope I don't sound too starstruck, but I know you guys live regimented lives from listening to the podcast, and I do too. I spend every morning on my uh, on my walk listening to podcasts, and you guys are on my top three rotation, and I catch all of the podcasts, so it's it's great to actually be talking to you, and I appreciate oh, the thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Much, much appreciated. So before we before we get into too much, and I mean, like it, it happens every time we start talking before I hit record and then we immediately go into what we should be talking about when we record. So before yeah. we get to what we were what we were talking about before we stop real quick, give everybody sort of the, the background of who you are, where you came from and why you're doing what you're doing now. And then we can get specifically into tech risk, what it does, how agents can talk about it, how it helps them write new business, how it helps them retain business i mean we've definitely got another 50 minutes worth of stuff to talk about so i don't yeah. want to delay anymore give them the background so they know you're credible and then we're off to the races sure um well listen i've i'm i'm originally from california i come from a midwestern family uh we moved around a lot when i was young but landed in palo alto california um and i went to high school there sometime around the early tech boom in the 80s which was pretty cool. A lot of folks uh, in and around my neighborhood and my high school, et cetera, you know, were working for companies like Atari and Apple and, you know, Osborne and all these interesting tech companies that were emerging. Um, and that was really interesting. I think I grew up with a, you know, a very good comfort with software. I wasn't much of a programmer. I, I did a little bit of programming in school, but um, you know, by the time I went to college, I was that guy with a PC and all the software everyone wanted to use to get their papers done, which maybe was a mistake. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I went back to the Bay Area um, after college, uh, got started in a tech career. Um, long story short, I spent the last 25 years in uh, software backgrounds with about 11 different startups. Um, it's taken me a lot of different places. I've lived in four countries. Um, I've worked, you know, with software that helps with very sensitive data, cybersecurity tools, um, sensitive data platforms, network operations for telcos. Uh, and, you know, myself, my co-founder, Dean, who we've worked together in a couple of companies, you know, we've been very successful in selling technology and we have a pretty unsophisticated strategy that we both discovered, you know, working together and sharing notes, which is, you know, when it comes to complexity and things that people may not understand, building relationships where people can trust you 
and helping them understand the business outcomes they want to drive to is what makes you really successful. And we were fortunate to drive success and really good outcomes in, in a lot of different companies um, by helping make the complex really simple and actionable. And that's in large part what we do helping independent agents with uh, cybersecurity and addressing the risks that their clients have and making recommendations that make people want to move forward in this and help them grow their business. The Atari, man. Dave, did you have one? That was like, the, that was one before my time. No, no, no. Before. Not Dave. Not Dave. Did you have one? Let me help you. Dave, do you still have your Atari? Okay. And the work? answer is the answer is yes, I do still have my Atari. Does, does it still work? I, I, well, here's the problem. <laughs> I don't know if it still works or not because I would have to figure out how to even connect the stupid thing to the TV. <laughs> because back then, man, we you know it Jeez, was the, the, red, the white and the yellow, man. Just yeah, like one of those was, splitter things that wasn't even the white and the yellow. It was a splitter like this that had prongs, and yeah. there were screws on the back of the TV. You, you had to buy to, an adapter. That's yeah, you had to you had to unscrew that and then slide the thing in and then tighten it down. But it gets more complicated because then when cable came, you had to have cable and the Atari both attached to the connector. And then there was a there was a but 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 before cable, it was just literally a switch that you flipped up or down. You either watch TV yeah. on antenna or you were over to play for the Atari. That was a 1980. That was 1981 HDMI okay. one right there. That was HDMI was one. When, yeah, I'm, I'm remembering that exact device as you talk about it, Dave, and that's uh, that's exactly what we had. And, you know, my dad was a pretty serious guy and, you know, expected a lot of us. But when we brought Atari into the house and started playing and showed him how everything changed, we started having a lot of fun together. I have great memories about what Atari's impact was to my family. That's funny. So my, I, I remember. So that came out in, in 81. Is that is that right? Is that what you just said? Yeah. Okay. So then Super Nintendo and all that stuff came out and, and like the first Nintendo came out not too long after that, I would imagine. Um, but like, I remember one of the best Christmases as a kid, we got like the N64 and like my brothers were, I don't, I don't know how old I was. I was like 13 or something like that. But like my, I, I, I would walk out on the porch sometimes to see my dad out there, like trying to get down on Mario Kart. And it was like, cause it was like the only thing that he could, like comprehend how to do is pretty funny right. but i i agree with that i mean it definitely uh it, it kind of meshed the the two generations together for a little bit which was cool yeah well that adapter was a universal adapter it wasn't just for the atari it was for the vcr or whatever else you might have because hey, the max. yeah it was literally just for you to slide up and down to determine which of the two things you're going to look at i don't know crazy stuff man but I mean, you talk about um, using cyber to help agents write more business. Let, let's just maybe, I rattled off a bunch of different things that Tech Risk's capable of doing. Let's just knock them out one at a time. Helping agents write sure. more business, that's something every agent wants to do. How does Tech Risk specifically, without giving away any of your secret sauce, what does it do to set agents up to be in a position to go out and write more new business? Knowing we're in a hard market, man, these, these ladies and gentlemen need every weapon they can get in their arsenal at this point. Yes, they do. And I was just reading a, uh, a cyber report from Tokyo Marine today that showed that uh, it's about to get harder. So um, look, cyber is sometimes complex. It's definitely a pain. It, invo it can involve a lot more work. And it's something that very few agents um, who are independent agents working with small and medium-sized businesses are really focused on. Um, and it can be a distraction to them if it's, you know, not done properly. And, you know, the big guys, the, the larger agencies, they see the opportunity and they're investing in very expensive employees and resources that it's just not realistic for, for smaller agents to do. Um, and, it's kind of unfair that it seems like the the cyber business today is expecting every independent insurance agent, in addition to doing so many different things to help their clients, to become a part-time cybersecurity expert. Um, and that's risky. You know, risk transfer is the business you're in, but it starts to feel to a lot of agents like 
risk transfer is transferring risk from the client to the agent. And, you know, there's E&O risks that you have to be careful about. You have to make sure that you guide your client properly. And that can go wrong in a lot of ways if you're not careful. What we're really focused on is helping clients to diagnose risk very carefully. So we, we build relationships with agencies and we say, let us help engage the client. And let us shepherd them through that important conversation so we know how they use technology in their business. And from that, we can really understand a lot of great detail about um, you know, what they have in place, if they have a culture of cybersecurity, if they look at improving their cyber posture, like, like wellness, you know, not unlike health insurance. Are they doing things proactively to make sure they're safe? Are they building a culture of cyber wellness? And how do we best paint that picture? And how do we best protect them for their unique risks? You know, if you look at what a lot of agents are doing, they're often selling pretty generic policies that are, you know, fast and easy to get. And you know, selling the the one million dollars in coverage and not really taking a look at all the issues that um, can make that inappropriate. You guys may be familiar with the term silent cyber, um, which is kind of a big industry term of all the complexities that are in place that um, limit the benefits that your client can get. You know, sometimes there's a, a cumulative million in coverage, but there's a 100k ransomware sublimit and that'll drop to you know less if they aren't enforcing cybersecurity controls and you know if MFA isn't enabled across the board you know you can have a 25k retention fee added these are pretty common things that are in a lot of policies and the bottom line is if you proactively address cybersecurity and put the right things in place you can call the shots and you can say to the underwriter, here's what I want. These are the kind of limits I want. Um, this is what the client has. I have it certified by a third party. And these guys are doing all the right things. And I want the optimum coverage terms for the size of their business, the, the vertical that they're in, et cetera. So, I mean, that's part of what we do. That's the upfront part that helps understand the risk, um, get the right coverage for them. And the second big part of what we do is we're helping them to build that culture, um, improve that culture. And we're using data throughout the course of the term to get ready for that next renewal. So when it comes up, they can get even better terms and coverage and they can be on their way. And before you know it, you're delivering a program to your client in this new area where they're really flying blind and they're building knowledge and protecting themselves and getting the best deals in the industry. And that's what we really wanna help independent agents do. So talk about retention. I mean, new business and retention is somewhat the same, but I think from an agent strategy standpoint, sometimes we get a little bit weird when it's somebody who's already in our book of business, right? And, and what I mean by that to clarify is we've already asked the tough questions. We've already looked under the sheets just to close the deal and bring them in. And now I think that there's a subset of people out there who probably look at accounts once they're on their books and say, well, this thing hasn't had anything major happen to it. It's not running hot or anything. Why don't we just let it just sit and, and simmer the way that it is for Probably right now? Not, let's, even bringing, not even bringing up. Yeah, let's not upset the apple cart. Let's not go, <laughs> you know, what you don't see is in, in what you don't know is not going to hurt you, which is, by the way, is not <laughs> advice. It, it, not it's true. not, a, yeah, it's not <laughs> advice that I'm giving by any stretch, but I think, yeah. look, man, it's like this. You know, I don't know if anybody else dealt like this, but we're transparent on this podcast and I have no problem telling people that I was absolutely in horrible financial shape in my early 20s because I blew my credit and I ran a business into the ground and all of that. But I liken it to when bill collectors used to call. And I thought that by not answering the phone, the bills would just go away. Yeah. Right? Like yeah. I think yeah. that a lot of people look at their book of business that way. I think they look at their book of business and they know they need to probably bring in somebody to tell them everything no that needs to be fixed. <laughs> but they don't they don't want to upset anything or they just they 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 get anxiety over it. 
Yeah. And I know that's a weird phenomenon to say, but I see it happen all the time, man. I know there are well-qualified agents out there that I have had the opportunity to compete against and have subsequently taken accounts from that I know these people. I know they have the ability yeah. to, to fix things. And it's just like self-preservation more than doing the right thing for your client. Or I don't know. It's just a weird thing to think about. Well, it is a weird thing. And, you know, I think that comes from folks knowing that they don't have the answers for the client and sometimes struggle struggle to articulate the benefit of carrying a cyber policy. And, you know, we sometimes make the analogy that, and we know this from talking to a ton of agents, everybody needs a buddy in cybersecurity. You know, if you have a buddy that can help you in your business, what do they do? They make it faster and easier for you. They know what they're talking about. They bring credibility. They help you serve the client needs. And hopefully, you know, they'll do it on the cheap for some beers and they'll be around to support the client when they need anything. And that's very much what we do. So when we look at how you, you know, approach the client with this, it's important to understand a client's risks. And it's hard to understand their risks in cyber without a background in that. Um, I got to see um, uh, Ms. The, the Ryan gentleman behind uh, Ryan Specialty uh, up in Chicago recently. And he said something very interesting, which is, you know, you, you have to be focused on helping discover your client's risk and then addressing it with them. That's simply the formula for success over and over again, consistently, persistently, et cetera. And I think that's a really good message. You know, there are risks for all kinds of businesses out there. And we've done hundreds of assessments for businesses and have not yet found anybody who has zero exposure to cyber risks. Um, and that's one of the things that I think we're helpful for. You know, we can have simple conversations with people, strip the tech jargon out of it, and just speak plain English about how they use technology in the business. We often ask them to um, set a meeting with, you know, someone with some visibility of the software tools they use, et cetera. But in that conversation, we can get to the bottom of it. Um, we can identify the risk. We can put recommendations together, not just for coverage, but the cybersecurity controls they need. And we can even use the data we capture to populate all those complicated apps and downstream um, uh, different policies, uh, language that you need to populate so that that back and forth doesn't become, you know, a huge issue find that when people are, you know, sharing supplements and, oh, we got another ransomware supplement and, you know, five conversations with the underwriter, it's, it's a real um, struggle for people. And if you begin with the end in mind, really proactive and have a good understanding of their risk and get them committed to fixing them before they go to market, that's proactive loss control. And that's the best way to approach this business. Yeah. I think those two things that you brought up initially, the, people who just don't really think that they have an exposure and then the complicated jargon of the cyber industry are probably the two main things that, that come up. I, I, I would think. Yeah. I think, I think the third, there's a third one. I, I think the third one is the, um, the turf war that happens if you have a tech resource in house, right? Meaning, I go to call on somebody, they've got a CTO, they've got a managed services provider relationship they've had for years, pay them a lot of money. And now all of a sudden, Johnny Cyber walks in the front door and tells them all the things that are jacked up. I think you can run into some heartburn there. And there's there's a, a delicate way that you handle that situation to let that that in-house resource know you're, you're not there to, to show everything that's wrong. You're there to yeah. show them everything you can do to help them because they're looking at things from a broad perspective. You're looking at everything from a very narrow perspective. I mean, you're simply looking at one slice of all of the IT needs and specifically cyber security and doing everything you can to tighten that up. And I mean, it's just, it's interesting. We run into the same thing, man, when we're dealing with comp counts that have problems with workers comp and yet there's a safety person or a risk manager, yeah. you know, 
the, yeah. the the normal side of me, you know, the the very quick, dry side of me wants to go in and say, look, guy, if you're doing your job, I wouldn't be here to begin with. If I was doing your job, your experience mod wouldn't be a 2.78. You know, I, I could give them all the reasons why I'm there, but that's not going to get me anywhere, right? So you're yeah. better off figuring out a way to go in, befriend this person, show them you're on the same side, help them get things fixed that need to be fixed. Because, you know, here's what I know. The guys that sit in my seat and Kyle's seat and these people that are, you know, that are that are out there as agents that are selling cyber, they're doing it because we know we we're doing the right thing by our client. But we're yeah. not IT people, man. That's I don't right. I, I can't get in the middle of a pissing match between tech risk and a CTO of a company because I might as well be listening to you guys sitting there speaking Mandarin. I'm yeah. not gonna have yeah. any idea what you're even talking about. All well, I need to cool. do is be a conduit yeah. and, and create a relationship and let you guys figure out how to get along. And, and that's, you know, the, the topic you raised, David, is exactly why um, having some good salesmanship involved in this process to finesse these complexities is super important. You can't pose a threat to those people. And just like you said, you don't have IT expertise. Well, guess what? That MSP or that IT manager, um, he may know cybersecurity, he may not, but he probably doesn't know insurance. And so it really doesn't matter what they do or don't have in place. It's about satisfying the appetite of insurance underwriters. And that's the outcome that we want to finesse. So when we run into that, we stand alongside those guys and say, look, here's what we want to do. We want to learn what we can to paint the best possible picture and then make some suggestions about what those underwriters are going to expect, and then give you guys some options to look at improving those things prior to going to market. You know, it might involve additional costs, but when you look at the difference in premium that you're going to get quoted and how few people will quote it if you don't have these things, it makes a big difference. So are we together on that concept? And they always say, oh, absolutely. That's brilliant. What about retention, man? How do we keep the business on the books? We started down there and then I said it gets a little bit weird because I think sometimes people, you know, just would rather let let the sleeping dog lie. But I mean, yeah. What, what are you guys doing from a retention standpoint? Because I think and let me let me put it to you this way. I think if we if we bring an a, an outside person in, if we bring a partner in to help us get the deal done, it's reasonable to assume that we're gonna keep that person engaged throughout the relationship. Otherwise, yeah. you're not doing what you promised you were going to do at the point of sale. You bet. I, I think it's different, though, when you didn't use that partner to come in. Now you've got the account, and now you're in a position where you need to introduce somebody who could potentially have bad news, could potentially cost your client a little bit more money if they need to spend money to upgrade something or comply with something or whatever else. So, I, I mean, I do think that that makes it a little bit different, but how are agents using you from a retention standpoint? Or do you have a good example of a time where an agent had an account, they thought that they, you know, they, they should have brought you in originally, they didn't, but they got the account done anyhow, but now in order to keep it and get renewal terms, they really need to bring somebody in. Do you have a good success story? And I know that you guys are still relatively new in the space, so no pressure if you don't have one, but, you uh, know, no my, my thought, I was gonna say, my thought process is, for as little as agents typically are willing to ask for help when they should be, and even taking a step further, you know, most people think for cyber, Oh, I'll just go on his, I'll just go on the, the internet and, and get a quote and sell the policy. And now everything's taken care of. Like right. what's a good success story. Cause I got to believe that anybody you get in front of turns into a success story, as long as you keep them from, you know, yeah, having well, issues down the road. So yeah, that is an important point. And what typically happens is, you know, and, and it's interesting, Carrie Wallace talks a lot about this from Agency Focus. She was involved in the 101 Western Labs quite a bit. And um, cyber itself is a pretty sticky process once people buy into the value proposition. But what we do is use data from all of the things we learn in the risk assessment process and anything else that we may capture through the deployment of cybersecurity solutions to paint a picture of improved performance week after week, month after month, quarter after quarter. This gives the agent some good touch points when there's improvement, which we deliver to them, and it also speeds the renewal process. We make recommendations all the time, and 
sometimes there's a first pass and they'll say, well, you know, these are the things that we think we're going to go forward with. And uh, the rest of it, you know, we just want a simple policy, or maybe they say we're going to take a pass on it. Um, but inevitably, what's increasingly happening is a, a good cyber risk profile in itself outside of insurance is becoming as necessary as a Dun and Bradstreet or good credit report. And people are doing deals where, you know, a, a new company that they're all excited about closing says, hey, we just need you to fill out this data security sheet because we'll be sharing data and, you know, some APIs. And therefore, we just need to make sure, you know, you're all buttoned up in the cyber department. And then they'll come back to their agent and say, hey, you know, those things we talked about, we need to move forward with and put them in place so we can, you know, close a deal with someone. Um, we see that a lot where someone we made suggestions to and they kind of yeah. didn't get around to make a decision will come back to their agent and say, oh, shit, we've got to get this in place to be able to do business with these, you know, with these accounts that we're bringing on board. So this is becoming kind of a, an expectation that people have proper cyber hygiene and that they can proactively prove it. And that's one of the main things that we're trying to help these small, medium sized businesses who make up you know, all of your clients with, and that is, you know, how do you put the basics in place so you can tick those boxes and not only make your business safer, but be able to do business with others, make them confident you can share data without being a massive risk to your business partners. And that's part of what's happening out there that we see all the time. So how does the agent interaction work with you guys? Like, is it something where, you know, I've got I've got a prospect, I bring him to you. I like talk a little bit about that engagement and what that looks like. And then going back to the prospect, kind of kind of how it all should should yeah. work. Yeah. So look, sometimes um agents will want to, you know, do one or two accounts to build their confidence in the process. And once they go through the process once, they go, okay, great, I get it. You guys are gonna save me a ton of time, and that's awesome. They will typically book an assessment with us and we have an easy scheduling tool. In fact, on our website, we have a, a quick start page where you can put in a few parameters and we'll go out and schedule that session with the client. Um, we invite the agents to all those. They usually all attend the first one. Barely any of them attend the second one. They're very comfortable that, um, you know, it's a professional process that's, you know, not a, not a hassle to their client. Um, and then we'll deliver to the agent all the documentation that that they need. Um, we'll do an executive summary. This is designed to strip the tech jargon out, speak plain English about this is the company's business. This is their obligations to, from a, a regulatory standpoint. These are some of the risks that um, their industry uniquely faces. This is what they're doing and where they kind of rank. And these are our recommendations. They pursue, you know, some a cyber cyber policy that perhaps these are the appropriate limits given the following things, and that they perhaps might want to install this or that cybersecurity solution, which will tick all the boxes the underwriters want to see. Um, sometimes we'll be on the phone with their client for a short conversation to explain some of these things, which we're always happy to do. Um, we can deploy those solutions for them. We can validate and certify that they're in place. This is becoming really important to underwriters. They no longer want to just hand an app. This is particularly for standalone cyber. They don't want to just hand an app and trust that people know what it means and are doing all those things. They love to see proactive third-party uh, expertise say these things are in place. We did it. We certify it makes for a really strong submission. Um, and then, you know, they're off and running and we make, we build that sticky program as we go. Um, and they come to know us kind of as the agents come to know us as their on-demand cyber department. And we do this, um, you know, we make our revenues off of the cybersecurity controls and some downstream data products that we're building. Um, so we do this at no cost to the agent. They can bring us in use us to profile their client base. And this is typically what we like to do is say, let's look at, you know, the, the accounts that are either going to renew or any of your commercial accounts that you're going to for any type of coverage over the next 60 or 90 days. And 
let's have a chat with them and schedule a cyber risk assessment. You can tell them that, you know, this is something we like to do just to tick that box and identify any cyber risks that we see and make recommendations. No obligation, Mr. Customer, but we need to be doing that. It's essentially our responsibility. And from that, I think we have about a 93% success ratio of moving to the next phase and scheduling the risk assessment and pursuing policy. 93 is pretty good. Yeah, it's a, you know, it's, I think people are really surprised that I think when you when if you did a survey across your clients, you'll see that they believe in a lot of myths. Those myths sound like, oh, my industry doesn't have a risk, or that's okay. You know, we've got everything in the cloud. We're buttoned up. <laughs> I um, love that one. That one's the best. Yeah. It's all in the or, cloud, baby. Here's one we hear all the time. It's like, um, well, we use nothing but Macs, and Macs are immune to viruses, so we're good. Naturally. <laughs> And, you know, none of these things are true. Everybody has risks. Um, cybersecurity is tricky because it, it's a game where, you know, you're you're trying to outrun the, the slower companies. You don't necessarily have to put everything in place, but there are some basics that the bad guys are looking for in order to determine if they, you know, they're qualifying. Do I spend time with this company? Is there something here? And how easy is it to get? And they've all started to focus on smaller companies with less sophisticated processes. And it's a huge business for them. You know, it's, I think the stats are that uh, $10 trillion in theft from cybersecurity events took place. That's like drawing a line on the Rocky Mountains and wiping away all the business that's done west of the Rockies. That's what they're stealing every year. It's growing at an enormous rate. And you know, people need to expect that people are looking at their business and determining if there's easy way ins. And if there are, you know, they're at significant risk and they should put some basics in place. It's not pricey. It's not difficult, but people should be planning on what happens if we, if we're breached. I think, and I think that's the issue though, is that like you discussed and like we've talked about on the pod many times is that the majority of these are happening on small and mid-sized businesses and you get those small businesses that are in that mindset of you know um j- just like bottom line dollars that are coming in and out of the business and they don't want to they don't want to spend more money and then <laughs> but they're certainly not going to be able to you know pay a hundred thousand dollar ransomware attack like if that were to happen and they have no you know coverage for that so it's yeah. And, and, you know, they've been using insurance as a catch-all in the early days of cyber and expecting the, the carriers to pay anything that happens. You know, the carriers have really done a, a solid job of analyzing where the losses are coming from. And when people don't present a mature cyber posture, they're saying, we're in this together. You're going to have to pay higher retentions. You're going to have to cough up some of the cash. But if clients put the right things in place and minimize their risk, they can call the shots and they can say, this is what is in place. We're super resilient. We're building the right culture. So we want the following terms. And when you send it out that way with and know what you're looking for, you can get much better results. You guys can uniquely as agents serve their needs, get them the best deals, properly protect them and make the case that you know, when something happens, you're going to be glad you have this in place. Unbelievable, man. I, I just think there's so much going on. And, and like, if you, in case you can't tell, I'm like half distracted right now because I'm dealing with a legitimate cyber event for my agency while we are having this conversation. And it's, it's something that has to do with a vendor payment that I've not gotten, I've been waiting for for two months and now they're sending me a receipt showing that they sent it. Thankfully, this does not appear to be an insurance, like an insurance claim or any fraud. It just looks like somebody didn't put the right information in correctly, but uh, holy cow, man, like at the drop of a hat, your entire world can turn upside down. And as I'm listening to you talk while I'm trying to multitask, I'm thinking to myself, you know, I could uh, I could be sitting here in a really bad situation right now. Thankfully, we do have cyber protocols. Thankfully, we do have a managed services provider. Thankfully, we do have a really good cyber insurance policy. So as far, I mean, I've done everything proactive that we can do. I've done everything I can do to transfer the risk to somebody else. And yeah. the risk that I can't transfer, I've done everything I can to try and buy a policy to cover. 
but you still don't feel good when you when you find out like, hey, wait a minute, we sent that like three or four weeks ago. What's going on? You yeah. know, you know, wire fraud and from social engineering and you know, simple deception is not only growing and exploding, like it's the occurrence of it um, eclipsed ransomware in the first half of this year. Um, but it's become so sublimated that uh, when it happens, you might not, you know, get anything close to what you're expecting and see major losses from it. Um, my co-founder, Dean, his, he has a, a brother who's a real estate developer uh, and he was extremely happy that he was well taken care of with the cyber policy, but he asked us to take a look. And we looked at, at his policy and, and did a, a risk assessment. And he's got eight to 10 million bucks uh, in property investments flowing through his account at all times. And when we took a really good look at his sublimits, they were 250K. He thought he had $2 million in coverage and felt pretty wow. comfortable with that. And when we went back to the agent and made recommendations um, to increase his insured limits and make a couple of changes, put some solutions in place, he said, well, hang on, that's going to dramatically increase the price here. And we said, listen, these are the risks this client has, and you should present the actual risk to him without concern about the cost, but more concern about how do you protect them. And we helped coach him through some of that. And he talked to the client and the client said, okay, let's do it. We can't afford to be operating with that kind of, of risk. And he came back to us and said, they went ahead with it. I'm blown away. I never th would have thought they'd do it. But you know, we said, they're more concerned about losing millions than <laughs> hundreds of thousands and right. it's a pretty simple business case. And it's part of what we do. You know, We make the, the complexity simple to understand and help the agents to pose that to their clients. And, and what ends up happening is people say yes to cyber more frequently. Uh, they get the proper limits in place. They start to put controls in place and you become the hero. You're the one who's driven a program and you didn't really have to do much. And that's right. really our goal. I, I think agents too sometimes will have maybe an issue with because it is complex, right? I mean, we've talked about a whole bunch of different aspects of the cyber policy just in the 45 minutes or whatever that we've been going, but you, you'll get into a situation where a client will be like, well, you know, why do I need cyber? Like what, what's going to happen to me? I'm a, you know, I'm a 10 man plumber. Like, I mean, we, we collect payments, you know, we, we send out a bill or we send them an email for the payment. It's like, so I, I think sometimes maybe, you know, explaining claim situations and what could possibly happen to them maybe maybe an issue and why why some agents are um you know a little bit more hesitant to to push the cyber is there anything you guys do from that standpoint like maybe you know explaining some okay this industry xyz can happen these are some of the trends that we've seen talk a little bit about that yeah so good point kyle and that's absolutely important is that any advice that that you give any unique business has to be accompanied with, you know, some, some stories that they can appreciate that are relevant to their industry. And look, not everybody needs a standalone cyber policy. Some might need an endorsement or, you know, a BOP that they can add it as an option. But at the end of the day, um, you have to be able to articulate to them, hey, these are the things that can happen. I want you aware of it. And when you advise the client to this, it's okay if they decide, well, now's not a good time for me to do this. I don't, you know, I don't want to move forward with it, but God forbid you never share that with them. And something, yeah, exactly. you know, we're seeing record litigation coming and it's no, from no small part from cyber people thinking you that they told me that. Insurance. What's yeah. that? I said, well, oh, you never told me that, that that could happen. Yeah. That's not where I was going with this. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, that it's better to be safe than sorry. We've designed our process to present no cost to the agent. So, you know, we encourage agents to do this across your full book of business. And even if they don't want to have these discussions or don't want to move forward with it, we capture that information. And we're an independent third party of cybersecurity professionals who anytime anybody wants to say, the topic never came up. Well, actually on October 5th, we sent you the following thing. You communicated clearly. You didn't want to. Here's our third party company. And 
they can deliver the bad news. Mm -hmm. So what, what's coming up next for you guys? Like what's, what's on the horizon that you're excited about? So, you know, we're, we're, so we're, you know, we, we were founded in April, 2021, and we've been building relationships with agents, um, building our reputation, but we're sprinting towards a statistically significant sample data size, because what we really want to do is something that we know we'll be able to do when we have a large enough um, set of clients that we've done this with. We want to start using the data and some machine learning capabilities to look for patterns and prove that these inside out cyber risks can actually be valuable in predicting risk. And the reason we want to do that is we want the carriers to say enough monkeying around with these apps and causing confusion with the clients and with the agents. Let's use assessments. They're more reliable. They'll help us predict risk better. They'll call to attention things that a static paper PDF never will. And that's where we want to go. We think that inevitably this is a better way to engage clients in discussing cybersecurity. If you look at how cybersecurity companies do pen tests and all of the sophisticated services from SOC 2, et cetera, that they deliver to clients, they do assessments with them. This is the best way to not only understand what clients are doing, but make sure they understand the questions and validate that their response is actually accurate. You know, we have people tell us all the time when we talk, you know, do you use any enterprise tools that monitor endpoints? This is sometimes called endpoint detection and response or EDR. Does that sound familiar to you? And oh yeah, I have this uh, antivirus tool I've used for the last 10 years. We got that covered. That's not the same thing. And we don't need to bicker with them. We just capture reliably what it says and make recommendations. Um, and that's kind of the most elegant way to handle the, the confusion in the industry is actually point them in the right direction and profile it accurately. And, you know, that's what we're all about. So how can we help you, man? How do, where do we drive the agents? Where do they need to go to learn more? How do they reach out to you to find out how you can help their clients? You bet. So I appreciate that. And uh, we'd love to talk with any interested agencies who want to grow their cyber and want to want to be serious about that because um, we can grow your book of business 50, 100 percent plus in a short time. You can go to techrisk.com. It's spelled T-E-K-R-I-S-Q dot com. We have a quick start page where if you want to sign clients up, you can do that. But we recommend let's schedule a quick conversation. Um, we're happy to get on the phone, explain how it works. Very simple onboarding process. And, you know, we can start working with your clients within days. So it's pretty easy to take advantage of and just reach out to us that way. Um, or you can send an email to info at techrisk, I-N-F-O at T-E-K-R-I-S-Q dot com. And uh, we'll be happy to respond, set up some time to talk about your unique practice, your clients. Um, and do this in a digestible way that doesn't represent a ton of additional work. We take a lot of that work off of your hands. Um, and, you know, we use automation and things to remind clients to, to do different things. But um, we're really focused on how do we most efficiently grow this business with the expertise that your clients need uh, to make this important decision. And, you know, we'd love to talk with all of your listeners about that. And, um, and hope to uh, hope to generate some business out of this as well as make some friends. This is a relationship business, and we recognize that it's extremely important that you trust the people that you do business with, and you place confidence that you know they're not going to do anything to cause any grief within your clients. So you know we we like to earn people's trust and give them confidence, and we can do that a couple customers at a time. Cool. So Good deal. Well, people, you heard it from the horse's mouth. Go check out the website. Figure out how in the world you can start helping your clients at a more meaningful level. Here's how I know you can't help them at a more meaningful level. Going online and using a vulnerability assessment from a cyber quoting engine and pretending like it's a roadmap to cybersecurity. Not going <laughs> to happen. Yet exactly. that's what the industry's conditioned us to do. Is it a good tool? 
Absolutely. But I would argue it's a better tool for marketing than it is for security. And if you really want to drive change in the operations you're working with, and you're not going to, you want to put, be able to put your name behind the work product, you really need to find somebody who's a specialist in cybersecurity and understanding how to build programs out for clients just like yours and mine. So really appreciate you taking time to be on the podcast with us today, Bill. You know, I'm sure that you're going to have people reach out looking for help. You know, I do think it's important that that people understand you're going to work with people all over the place. You you are in the cohort there at at 101 Weston Labs, but that doesn't mean that you're geographically restricted to working in the research triangle of North Carolina. You can help people anywhere in the country. And so I would encourage those of you out there, even if you have a question, even if you don't know whether or not Bill is the right answer to help you, ask the question because you're not going to find out the answer if you don't. And you may find out that he is the best answer and it saves an account or gets one across the finish line for you that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten. So we're going to go ahead and wrap it up, man. We appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. And hopefully you you and I talk soon, but look forward to hearing uh, success stories from the people who listen to power producers after they reach out and uh, you show them how you work your magic, my man. Awesome. Love it. Thank you guys so much. And it was great to talk with you and uh, hope to catch up in person one of these days, maybe one of these events. I will be in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, flying into Raleigh the last weekend of September. Shortly. I'll be at that show. So we'll see each other there. Well, the, but I'm not coming for a show. I'm coming for Mick Hunt's wedding. So I'm going to be, <laughs> <laughs> which is also quite Mick, a show. We're not invited. <laughs> yeah, which is also quite a show possibly, but um uh, yeah, we're flying into Raleigh and then we're going down to Chapel Hill and his wedding is Friday. We're flying in Thursday evening, be there all day Friday. So if you want to grab lunch or something, or if there is um, a show that I need to know about, maybe I can make my way there. But then his wedding is that evening and we're turning around and flying back Saturday morning because we got Eric Church that night. That'd be awesome. You might want to miss church. Can't miss church service. That's true. Well, oh. you might not want to miss the Tar Heels. They can play football now. Oh, Yeah. 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 Had some big wins in the last couple of weeks. They used to say that about USF like 15 years ago, and they fooled us. When I was there, man, that was the last time they were good. Yeah, <laughs> back when they were undefeated. Yeah, dude, they were ranked number two. Ohio State was one, and then we both. No, I remember. I remember when they played. The rest of the year. It was a big deal. They beat Rutgers that year. Rut- I don't remember. Or Rutgers is West the one who. West Virginia. It was a Thursday night game, and we all we all rushed the field after the game. It was wild. People from West Virginia are disappointed in you because they taught you how to be lazy and just burn couches instead. (laughs) That's what we did. We burnt our furniture on our front porch. Anyhow, we're out of here, people. You just got bonus content. See ya. There you go.